Well, good morning and welcome online, everyone. Uh, we are back to this. Hopefully, it's just for a short time, uh, but we're looking to our God together. And today, we'll hear from God's Word. Uh, we're back in our beginning series in Genesis, and we'll reflect in song, we'll pray, and, and there's a story reading for the kids as well. So thanks for all those who have helped get that together. Uh, let's come before our Lord in prayer. Lord, as we come before you in a time of uncertainty, uh, we praise you that you are faithful. You are always with us. And we can trust in your goodness and grace. Lift our hearts together today as we come before you in worship. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Well, let's uh, hear from God's word in Psalm chapter 8. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes. You still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honour. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands and put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen and all the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. This morning is taken from Genesis chapter 1, starting at verse 26, 
and it goes on to chapter 2, verse 3. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds of the air and all the creatures that move on the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it, I give every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw that all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it, he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. Hello, I'm going to be reading a story today. It's called God's Very Good Idea. It's a true story about God's delightfully different family. And it was written by Trillia Newbell. In the beginning, in fact, before the beginning, God had a very good idea. It was an even better idea than solar panels, 1954, the super soaker, 1982, chocolate chip cookies, 1938, colour TV, 1942, fireworks, 700 BC, the life raft, 1880, roller skate, 1760, x-ray machine, 1895. God's idea was to make people, lots of people, lots of different people, who would all enjoy loving him and all enjoy loving each other. They would all be made in his image. They would all be like mirrors reflecting what God is like. Because God is full of love, they would be full of love too. So God got to work. He made a beautiful world for the people to live in. Then he made the first people, a man and a woman. And then he said to them, be happy, enjoy loving me and loving each other. Have a huge family that will fill the earth and look after the earth and enjoy the earth. God carried on creating people, all of them made in his image, and all of them were different too. Some were men, some were women, some like reading, some like riding bikes, some had darker skin and some had lighter skin, and some had curly hair and some had straight hair. We live in God's world. We are all different, but we are also all the same. Everyone you see is different than you and the same as you. They might look different or speak different or play different, but they are all made in God's image. And so they are all valuable. This is God's very good idea. People ruined God's very good idea. The first people chose not to love God. This is called sin. And because they chose not to love God as they should, they forgot how to love each other as they should. We are the same. We choose not to love God. And so we are not able to love each other like we should. We sin. Sometimes we treat others badly because they are different than us. People fight with each other. People are mean to each other. People laugh at each other. Because we have ruined God's very good idea, he is not pleased with us. Our sin means we can't be friends with him or enjoy living with him. 
We need God's forgiveness for ruining his very good idea. It's the same for everyone in the world. People who like reading need forgiveness. People who like riding bikes need forgiveness. People with darker skin need forgiveness. People with lighter skin need forgiveness. People with curly hair need forgiveness. People with straight hair need forgiveness. But God was not surprised by people ruining things. He had always had a very good plan to rescue his very good idea. So God got to work. He came to earth as a person, Jesus. Jesus loved people who were different than him. He loved people no one else loved. He always enjoyed loving all the different people he met. Jesus shows us how to enjoy loving each other. But people didn't love Jesus. Instead, they hated him. They put him on a cross to die. But this was part of God's plan. On the cross, Jesus took our sins so that we can be forgiven. Jesus gives his people for their sins. Jesus didn't stay dead. He rose back to life and then he went back to live in heaven. And then he gave the people his spirit to help them enjoy loving him and loving all the different people they know. Jesus helps us to love each other. One day God will finish his very good idea. Jesus will come back and make the world perfect again. And anyone who has asked Jesus to forgive them will live there with their different languages and their different skin colours. They will enjoy loving God and loving each other. They will enjoy praising God for making, rescuing and finishing his very good idea. But this is a very, very, very good part of God's very good idea. You don't have to wait till then to enjoy it. Jesus welcomes anyone to ask him to forgive them. And when Jesus welcomes someone, he welcomes them into his family forever. He welcomes people who like reading and people who like riding bikes. He welcomes people with darker skin and people with lighter skin. He welcomes people with curly hair and people with straight hair. God's family is called a church. Your church friends are your brothers and sisters, your wonderful and colourful church family. You can enjoy loving them and loving God with them. This is God's very good idea. Lots of different people enjoying loving him and loving each other. God made it. People ruined it. He rescued it. He will finish it. And with your church family, you can enjoy being part of it right now. Wasn't that a great story? Morning, everyone. Let us join together in prayer. Heavenly Father, you alone are holy, Lord, and you alone are worthy of worship. We turn our back on all the worthless idols that constantly tempt us in our daily life in this fallen world and focus on you. We know that even though we are meeting again online, you have promised that where two or more are gathered in your name, so also are you present. You alone are worthy of praise and we are humbled by your holy presence and reminded that the vast gap between sinners and you can only be bridged by your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour. We confess we have not loved you with all our heart and soul and might and mind and we have not loved our neighbours as we love ourselves. We pray that you would forgive us our sins and strengthen our faith so that we may rejoice in your redemption and welcome your coming kingdom. We long for the day when you will be revealed in your glory and this fallen world will be replaced by your kingdom in all its holy majesty. Lord, this is a troubled world and there are many distractions that discourage us from doing your will. 
and seeking to be useful in proclaiming your gospel. However, we know that you are still in control. We pray that you touch our hearts through the Holy Spirit and lead us to focus on you and be more faithful in our Christian walk with you. The snap lockdown on Friday has forced sudden changes on us and created frustration. So we pray for your support in revising our plans and looking for ways to still carry out your ministries at Elpham Presbyterian Church. We pray that you lift up the spirits of all your church members during the lockdown. We pray also that the lockdown may in some way, not currently known to us, be a further instrument to bring your people to you. We bring to you today a number of ministries and concerns for your blessing and strengthening. Firstly, the mainly music team and families that returned on Thursday this week after a long break. We praise you, Lord, that they could finally get back together. We know that there were some concerns with the current restrictions, but we pray that the team and the families were encouraged by starting up again and will look forward to resuming after the lockdown ends. Secondly, we pray for our whole church as we return to an online service. Our plans for the second service at 4pm have had to be put on hold. Encourage us all to look for opportunities to invite others to follow us online. The current hotel quarantine issues with the outbreak and the government response. We pray that you might limit the outbreak and control the spread of the virus. We bring to you our Sunday school classes and teachers who were prepared to start back properly today but have had to put their plans on hold. We pray that you encourage them as we wait patiently for the lockdown to be effective. We pray also for Don, Anne, Brendan and Carolina in Queensland. We pray that the family reunion will be joyful and further refresh them. We pray that you keep them safe and that their plans to return to Melbourne will not be thwarted. We pray also for the various ministries which have commenced again or are about to commence including Evergreens, Craft Group and growth groups which enable us to support each other as we enjoy fellowship together, even if it's online as we have come to know. We pray all these things in the name of your glorious Son, Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Amen. Well, the book of Genesis tells us where we came from and who we are. And it's centred all around uh, what God did. Uh, Genesis chapter 1 is some, somewhat relentless in how it reports uh, what happened. There's a deliberate rhythm and structure to it. And while it's got language in common with other historical narratives in the Old Testament, like Kings and Chronicles, uh, it's also not devoid of artistry or, or theological depth. Uh, it's not simply a wooden account of someone's weekly diary. This is God's word, and God is a master of language in all its richness. God spoke, and it was so. His word is fulfilled. God saw that it was good, uh, and he forms the earth, and he fills the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, uh, the first, second and third days filling the earth, forming the earth, uh, and the next are to do with filling it. Uh, and the fifth day comes with the aquatic and the aerial creatures, uh, the fish and the birds. Uh, and the terrestrial, terrestrial animals come on the sixth day. Verse 25, it's all the animals. It is God's good design and it's describing the world that we see around us and our place in it. And far from being a primitive, anti-scientific or even anti-human document, there's a surprising sophistication to this. And the more you read it closely, the more I think that becomes evident. So today we'll tackle uh, this passage in three different sections. Our identity, our purpose 
and our future. So if you've got a Bible there, uh, press pause, go and grab one uh, so you can follow along with me, with me. That would be really helpful. So firstly, our identity. Walt Heyer uh, was at the top of his form in his career. He was married with children when at the age of 42, he realised that he'd never stopped wanting to be a woman. He was advised that a sex change would solve all of his problems and so he started taking hormones, he had surgery and changed his name to Laura and he came to deeply regret what he'd done and he wrote later, I was generally happy for a while but being a female turned out to only be a cover-up, not a healing and I knew I wasn't a real woman no matter what my ID document said. And as Christians, we ought to never endorse a, an uninvited or forced conversion therapy. Uh, but we cannot ignore that the Bible teaches a different account of human identity uh, than that of our prevailing culture. And we've got some hurdles now uh, as some new legislation has been passed in the Victorian Parliament and it sets its sights on what we're looking at today. So what is to happen when you believe it is ultimately God who does the converting? Uh, when you believe he is the source of all healing and wholeness and true identity and, and he is the authority on what it really means to be human. And in fact, he came as one himself. I wonder how they'll legislate against that. Uh, look with me at verses 26 and 27. Uh, I'm reading from the ESV, the English Standard Version. So verse 26, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Uh, you see the plural terms there uh, that God uses as a trinity. Uh, but then verse 27, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. And what is common between God's creatures is that they are created according to kind and created to be self-propagating. The creator is about making creators and we share that, and we share the same day as the animals. Uh, but we are different. Uh, we sh share something more in common with God. And that makes us distinct. No other creature has been created in God's image. Animals were not given dominion over creation. Uh, they don't have a conscience, and so they're not accountable as human beings are. Well, the Bioethicist Peter Singer, uh, who was from Melbourne, uh, thinks that animals and humans are the same, and so animals should have the same rights as human beings. Uh, and he says this in his book, uh, those who protest against abortion but dine regularly on chickens, pigs and calves only show a bias for their own species. Uh, a fish shows more signs of consciousness than an infant. Therefore, terminate at will, even beyond birth, even. Or at the other end of life, the elderly. Put them out of their misery. Uh, they are not important. Well, Singer was once interviewed and asked why, after writing about this and arguing this case for euthanasia, he was keeping his elderly mother in a home. And he said, well, it's different when it's your mum. And his is an utterly confused view on human life. We are distinct from the animals. So how you treat your mum is going to be different to how you treat your horse or your cat or a cockroach on the floor of your kitchen, or I really hope that's the case uh, for you at home. There is one human race equal in value, and everyone you meet is made in God's image. And that ought to deeply impact your behaviour uh, in terms of how you treat others, uh, how you treat your work colleagues or your boss. Uh, it will reflect your view of humanity. And I wonder if there are people in your life that you don't give much time to. 
And there is no place for racism or sexism or ageism or classism in the Christian worldview. We are equal in dignity, uh, whether, that's, whether that's someone with an intellectual disability, uh, whether it's a child in the womb, or whether it's someone who is quite unwell who is in their 90s. But we all are also distinct from one another. Did you see that? It stands out uh, with two genders, male and female. And it turns out that that needs protecting too. There is no scientific evidence to support the idea that we all have a gender identity that can be separated from our biological sex. Well, that is according to Sharon James of the Christian Institute. And uh, that's in the UK. And she has this excellent book called Gender Ideology. Uh, There's nuances and and issues that she deals with in there uh, that we won't cover for the moment. uh, But I encourage you to read that book. Uh, uh, She refers to a recent uh, UK High Court ruling that supports the view that children should not be encouraged to take things like puberty blockers and doctors shouldn't be prescribing them simply because a child has decided they are something they aren't. And parents need to have the right to say to their... uh, have a say in their children's lives and to protect them from what is potentially irreversible damage. And there is a massive problem when children are the targets of a gender agenda uh, and they become the victims of an ideological war that we're fighting in the wider society. And parents, we need to be teaching our kids to be kind, uh, no matter what other people look like, how they dress, how they behave, what they believe. Uh, They are made in the image of God. But we also need kids to learn that it's not okay to be forced into something Uh, and and to believe something like gender ideology. And we have a right to believe that God made us male and female. And we need to learn to hold all of this in disagreement, uh, but also in love. We're going to need compassion on those around us who really struggle with this. And there is a way to empathise without affirming. And there are some aspects of masculinity and femininity that are social constructs, uh, depending where you are in the world. Uh, The idea that boys play with blue trucks and girls with pink dolls, well, that's a social construct. And we need to understand just how confused some people can be uh, and and have compassion on them and, and approach them with understanding. So where we fail so miserably in doing that and living that out, Well, Jesus came into this broken world as one of us. And there's a great mystery to that. And we'll look at it next week concerning marriage and God's design for that uh, and how this speaks to our relationships. But God's design for our identity is a much better story than we could ever come up with without him. Where we need the answer to who we are and where we come from God answers in his word. And we need to remember the sufficiency of scripture to engage the challenges that we face today and the power of the gospel, uh, the only remedy uh, that can heal our confusion and our brokenness. Uh, So that is our identity as part of God's good design. So secondly, our purpose The physicist Stephen Stephen Hawking uh, once wrote this, the human race is just a chemical scum on a moderate-sized planet orbiting around a very average star in the outer suburb of one among a hundred billion galaxies. But surely not. (laughs) That's not what this says. We are not so insignificant. And there is no randomness here, no chaotic primordial swamp, but rather a very careful and deliberate order uh, that displays the genius behind it. Uh, And incidentally, uh, Stephen Hawking's successor in the chair of cosmology at the University of Cambridge is Professor Paul Shellard, uh, who is a Bible-believing Christian. 
The Bible says there is a loving God, a God of grace, who is behind all that we see. Uh, and he has put us here for his purposes. So let's look at these next verses. Uh, look with me, verse 28. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over it, over the fish of the sea, and the, over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. God takes delight in what he makes. He doesn't make junk. He blesses them, he equips them, and he commissions them to do his work. And you see the two tasks there, uh, procreation and dominion. Uh, Today we'll deal mostly with dominion and we'll leave the other one for next week. Uh, Or kids, you can ask your mum or dad uh, about procreation. Uh, What God creates, he preserves, he sustains the life that he creates. And there's deliberate order again. Uh, Verse 29, God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face face of the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food, and likewise for the animals and the birds. uh, Everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. So God's good design for humanity was that they would enjoy what he created. Uh, And in in his providence, he gives food. Praise God for food. Uh, It's awesome, isn't it? Uh, Now, if you're a meat-eating barbecue fanatic, well, you might be taken aback somewhat from what we've just read. Uh, I often look at the vegetarian dish on the restaurant menu and think it just needs a side of bacon to make it complete. But it's not until Genesis chapter 9 that God explicitly says, I give you the animals to eat for food as well. Uh, And so this is hardly a case for vegetarianism. Uh, And of course you might say to me, well, Jesus ate meat, so 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 should we. Uh, And the rest of scripture needs to play a part here. Well, sigh of relief for some. But if I can uh, play devil's advocate and just make a defence of some vegetarians, we have plundered the earth far more than we should have. And we've upset a careful balance uh, when Brazilian rainforest is catastrophically cleared uh, for grazing cattle. And our mandate to rule has been used and abused along the way. And so post-industrial revolution, we have struggled to do things sustainably and sparingly, and perhaps a vegetarian is making a point there. Uh, But what this does do is set up the total perfection of what God made and the total harmony that that creation was intended for. You see that? Verse 31, God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. It was beautiful, and it's in a state of spiritual, social, and ecological perfection. And so humanity sits at the top of that, and what God establishes is their vice-regal position uh, with duties over creation. Uh, They are his ambassadors as image bearers who are to rule, Uh, and clearly there's a problem. Uh, because we have failed to live this out. Uh, We aren't living who we were meant to be. And instead of ruling as God's caretakers, uh, we've trashed the place. We've pillaged the natural world uh, rather than tended it as a garden. And we're a bit like those nightmare tenants that you see on a current affair from time to time who leave the house uh, with every wall kicked in, uh, all the windows are smashed and there's rubbish everywhere. The term dominion is a word used of a master over over a servant, an administrator over an employee, uh, or a shepherd's supervision of his flock. And it's not domination. It is care. Uh, And that should always have been part of a Christian emphasis, is care for the environment. And unfortunately, because of sin, dominion can be twisted and corrupted into cruelty and exploitation. Uh, And you and I were intended to be stewards of God's good creation uh, as caretakers. 
so even in the, in the garden here, uh, the one who would be ruler of all must be servant of all. And humanity's purpose was to live out this God-given mandate uh, to bring God glory, to fill the earth, to subdue it and, and have dominion uh, in a way that he would have them, uh, to enjoy what he has made uh, as those made in his image. And of course, there is only one who has done that perfectly. He is the only true servant king who has ever lived, not for himself, uh, but for us, for you and me. And in Christ, in a way, you become his ambassadors in the gospel. And the gospel is about spreading the news of God's kingdom far and wide. Uh, And that leads us to the next point, uh, to to see about our future. Now, the six days of creation come to an end, and so God rests here. Uh, So chapter 2, verse 1. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them, And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done and he rested on the seventh day from all his work. Uh, So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. Uh, He has formed the earth and filled it and now he rests. Uh, And the seventh day really sticks out as different to the others. Uh, There is no and God said on this day. Uh, His creative word isn't required. Uh, The seventh day is the only day to be blessed and made holy, uh, set apart as different. And again, if you look at the repetition, on the seventh day God finished, he rested on the seventh day, and God blessed the seventh day. Three times it's named. You get the sense it's important. Uh, Now, it's not only central to creation. The seventh day is the ultimate destiny of God's people, and we're going to see that uh, in just a moment. But the fact that he rests is quite fascinating, isn't it? Was it that God was tired? Uh, Was it a a one-day circuit breaker to interrupt his work? Well, not quite. Uh, It's not that God needed a breather. Uh, The word for rest really means to cease from. He stops creating, but that doesn't mean he stops all of his work. And so we see in uh, John 5, Jesus said, My father is working until now, and I am working. So God didn't stop working. Uh, God stopped from his creative work, uh, but he continued in his sustaining work uh, by his providence. If God had stopped doing that, well, the whole universe would implode instantly, uh, and we wouldn't be here anymore. God sustains the universe, uh, it says, by the power of his word, speaking of Jesus there. Uh, and so what's happening here is this deep sense of satisfaction and, and pleasure from his creative work. Uh, if you've ever built something, uh, perhaps you've experienced that moment of completion. Uh, if you're in the middle of building a house, uh, I can only uh, sympathise Uh, Perhaps you can only hope that you'll get in by Christmas and have that sense of satisfaction one day. This is a rest that has profound implications uh, for you and me. Uh, Augustine said, Lord, our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee. Uh, We have eternity written on our hearts, Ecclesiastes. We, We have this sense of dysphoria. Uh, that we are built for something more, something other than this life. Uh, C.S. Lewis uh, once said, if I find in myself desires which nothing in this world can satisfy, the only logical conclusion is that I was made for another world. Well, yes, but also this world. There is a peace and a security and a state of blessedness beyond collapsing on the couch at the end of the day. Uh, beyond a nice afternoon nap. Uh, It is a sense of joy and relief and peace uh, that is beyond our experience after Genesis chapter 3. And that is what this is pointing us to. Uh, God blessed it, he sanctified it, Uh, it is set apart from the other days and in a sense it still exists. 
Uh, there is, uh, there is no, uh, there was evening and there was morning. Did you notice that? It's missing on this day. Uh, because this one is, in a sense, eternal. It's existed since the first. Uh, you probably realise that it became important to Israel through the story of the Bible. It's in the fourth commandment. Uh, coming after the fall, after the flood, after Babel and the patriarchs, uh, after the rescue uh, comes the instructions. Uh, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Uh, and it was essential for Israel's spiritual and uh, physical health too. You cannot work 24-7. You've got to kill yourself if you try and do that. It is a rhythm for life, a pattern that points us back to the first and points us forward. And it says that there is more to life than work. And some of us really, really need to hear that. And it became a day to celebrate God's redemption, to remember that they were slaves in Egypt, and that the Lord had brought them out with a mighty hand and outstretched arm. And it became a sign of the covenant between God and his chosen people. And all of that pointed forward again, and Jesus rested from his work too, his work on the cross that created salvation, uh, that you and I need to be able to enter God's eternal rest. You cannot find rest another way. You and I need to find rest from our work because you cannot earn your way into this rest. And after the fall, uh, there's a risk that we would miss out on this rest. You can only enter it by faith in Jesus and you need to find that rest in him who has earned it for you. And so this is about our future, our hope. It's a present reality. You can experience rest for your soul even today by trusting in Jesus uh, in what he's done and knowing that uh, his righteousness and peace and joy in God's spirit actually frees you and will connect you to Jesus and it will change your life here and for eternity. And if you haven't yet found that rest, well, please check out our website. Have a look at thinklifethinkjesus.org for more about Jesus and get in touch. We'd love to connect with you and pray with you. Let's wrap up where we've been today. This is God's good design for humanity uh, it starts with an identity that we share like no other creature. We are made in God's image, male and female, uh, and that ought to amaze you uh, so that you can sing with David in Psalm 139, I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Uh, and each of us shares an identity that has been passed down uh, since the very first man and woman, and it ought to change uh, how we behave with one another. This ought to uh, give you a respect for the dignity of human life in every area of your life, uh, impacting every conversation that you have, every person you meet. And the gospel speaks to our failings when we've confused our identity and we've forgotten that fundamental. Uh, I mentioned Walt Heyer uh, just earlier you can go and uh, check out Walt's uh, testimony on our Think Life, Think Jesus website. Uh, there's this amazing interaction uh, between him and the pastor who uh, helped him and showed him such compassion uh, and grace and time and prayed with him. And Walt eventually found his identity in Christ. So you and I have a purpose. We're here for a reason. God intended that humanity would be his image-bearing princes and princesses uh, to rule where he would have us rule, uh, to care for the world and to seek to bring his kingdom rule to every corner of it, uh, to be part of his gospel work. See, we grieve God when we don't live out that purpose, when we pillage the earth and trample on others rather than to seek to rule as Christ-like ambassadors. Only the gospel will bring you back on track. And finally, we're intended for rest, our future. God would have us join him in that eternal satisfaction. Uh, take a day off 
and remember that God did too. Uh, and look to what only Jesus secures for you. His beautiful and satisfying and, and perfect rest that our restless hearts long for. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we praise you that you give us an identity. We are created in your image. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. Uh, And we see that human beings are so creative in art and music and technology and science and medicine, all this incredible genius that comes from you. Lord, we confess that we have badly messed up our part in this, your world. Uh, We have lived for ourselves rather than for you and for others, and we need help. We pray for those who struggle with their identity uh, in whatever way, and we ask that you would help us to have compassion on them and to hold out the hope that we have in Jesus. We thank you for him who lived as one of us, who died on our behalf, so that we might come and Uh, find forgiveness and restoration in you. Uh, We thank you for the promise that when we come to Jesus, he will give us rest. Help us to take time to worship you, uh, to find who we are in you and our purpose uh, and find ourselves working for your kingdom and glory. Uh, And in the Spirit's power and in Jesus' name we ask. Amen.